So we have another Persona title for the 3DS. In 2019, when the handheld was well on its way out and the Switch was already two years old at that point, it was pretty confusing to say the least. And interestingly, Persona Q2 New Cinema Labyrinth is the very last game to be physically released for the 3DS. With that in mind, is it not only a solid farewell to the 3DS, but also a superior sequel to the original Persona Q? Honestly, yeah, I think it is. I'm serious, while the changes and new additions aren't big, to me they greatly affect how the game plays and it becomes a more enriching experience. You don't have to play the first Q game to enjoy this one, especially given that the plots don't connect whatsoever. Not to say that Persona Q1 was bad by any means, I know I was pretty harsh on it in my review, but it has its merits too. And look, if you think I'm just saying all this because the Phantom Thieves are in Q2 now, then that's simply not the case. But yes, as well as the investigation team and C's teaming up, we now have the Phantom Thieves from Persona 5 joining the fight, minus Kasumi. And oh, who's that tucked away in the back there? Why, it's the female protagonist from Persona 3 Portable. My god, they actually acknowledge her existence. Once again, on the gameplay side of things, Persona Q2 takes the Etri and Odyssey formula and gives it a Persona makeover. It didn't sell as well in its opening week as the first game, but it still sold fairly decently overall. Though no doubt the reason for the lower sales was because of the 3DS's lifespan coming to an end. Like with the dancing games, I didn't buy Persona Q2 day one. I I hadn't finished the first game back then, I was still stuck in the Evil Spirit Club and not enjoying the latter half of that dungeon, so I left it for a while before starting over for the review. Q2 sold out pretty quickly though when it released, I guess they assumed not many people would be buying it, so by the time it was back in stock, I jumped on board before it went away again, and figured I may as well play the game I just bought, regardless of me not finishing the original. Quick warning folks, since this is still a newish game currently, while I won't be discussing the story in great detail, I will be showing off some minor spoilers like the boss fights and the labyrinths themselves because I really feel they're worth talking about. If you don't want to see any of that just yet, then now would be a good time to switch the video off and come back to it later, but I greatly appreciate you stopping by anyway. So in regards to the plot, unlike the first game, you only stick with one path throughout the whole adventure. You begin with the Phantom Thieves who are just about to get ready for their next voyage into Mementos. By the way, I felt so giddy hearing that remix of Last Surprise play as they step in. It got me really pumped up again. Anyway, moving on from the fanboy stuff. After the Phantom Thieves deal with their current target and continue driving around, the Mona car suddenly starts driving itself, eventually transporting them inside what appears to be a movie. Nearby them is also a gateway that leads out of the movie and into an empty theater, where we meet the curator named Nagi and an extremely shy film enthusiast named Hikari, both who also seem to be trapped in the theater. The projectionist for the movie is an odd creature called Doe, who appears to be harmless but doesn't say anything either. Everybody can go inside the movie at any time, but they'll experience real pain while fighting, not just on a mental level, but on a physical level, as shadows seem to be roaming around the movie as well, willing to kill anything that opposes them. The theater acts as a safe space of sorts, and just like the first game, there's a door in the theater with four locks that allows everybody to leave, but the only way to unlock each one is to change the outcome of the four movies that the party have to go through, giving them all happy endings. You see, unlike the original game, where it didn't really continue the main plot until the four labyrinths were completed, the movies in the second game each have a little side story with their own bits of conflict. It's not much of an addition, but it adds slightly more life to these worlds, and finishing each movie allows Doe to use what looks like his tears to form a key for one of the locks. That's super gross. In time, the Phantom Thieves will also meet up with C's and the investigation team who've been sucked into different movies while exploring Tartarus and the TV world. C's don't come in until around halfway through the game though, so I feel sorry for all the Persona 3 fans out there. But very early on, we do at least come across the female protagonist, and can I just say real quick, I love the female protagonist in this game. She still doesn't have a canonical name for some reason, but she was so much fun to have around. Her optimistic and bubbly personality was very contagious to me. She keeps trying to look for her team, and you can tell that she gets rather lonely not having them around while everybody else has their groups, but she always keeps her chin up and carries on moving forward. That's a good attitude for her to have, though that simply made things even more tragic when she thinks she's finally found
on her group, only to discover that it's actually Minato's and C's have no idea who she is, now leaving her all confused and disappointed. That was just heartbreaking. I wanted to give her a big ol' hug and tell her that everything's going to be okay. I felt so sorry for the female protagonist, but she doesn't let that bring her down completely, and that's really admirable. She's one of my new favorite characters in the series, and I keep her in my party as often as I can. The other characters are once again simplified to their most basic qualities with the same running jokes that either land or don't. Right down to Marie dropping her poetry again, which is still not funny, guys. I've already gone through all of that in my review of the first game anyway. And since we also have the Phantom Thieves and the female protagonist to put in the party now, I'm not gonna complain too much about a lack of character development. If you're also wondering what happened to Zen and Rei since the first game, uh, let's just say they won't be coming back. As for the labyrinths, this time all but the final one are based on different genres of movies. Kamashita Man is from the superhero genre, Junesic Land is from the disaster genre, AI Gis is from the sci-fi genre, and the unnamed dungeon is from the musical genre. There's an overlying theme with each of the labyrinth's side stories as well as the main plot about expressing your individuality and how sticking with the norm isn't always the best, with the dungeons giving their own take on it. The townspeople in Kamashita Man go with whatever Kamashita Man decides is justice, even if that person didn't actually commit any crimes. Junesic Land involves herbivorous dinosaurs trying to survive being hunted by carnivores, but are too afraid to fight back and always follow the majority rule for every decision they make. AI Gus takes place in a world filled with robots. However, one of the robots looking like I Gus is different from the others by having her own style, emotions, personal likes and dislikes, and passions, but is constantly referred to as an anomaly by the Overseer, bringing many I Gus down. And the musical dungeon is all about Hikari's past and why she has such a hard time coming out of her shell. All of these scenarios have something that I think a lot of us can really relate to when it comes to being your own person. I've been diagnosed with Asperger's syndrome since my early teens, and I'm not ashamed to admit that, but sometimes getting my voice out there has proven to be very difficult. It could be that I stumble on my words, I'm too afraid to speak up, or in most cases, I'm worried about what other people will think of me. It was especially tough when my family and I moved to England 15 plus years ago, and a lot of the kids would be ready to pick on me for being an American in a British school. To this day, I still occasionally struggle to speak my own mind, and this channel is my best way of helping that. Being on YouTube has allowed me to share my own opinions, and if someone disagrees with me and is being rude about it, then that's fine, because I don't have to speak with that person. It's all been a great practice for me, and I strongly encourage anyone who wants to start their own channel to do so, because it may boost your confidence too. It'll be a bit awkward at first, just look at some of my early videos, I think they're pretty terrible now, but that's all a part of your growth as a channel and as a person. Persona Q2's narrative is like that extra push you need to get you going, and it especially helps that the protagonists are all high schoolers because I can imagine a lot of Persona fans are currently going through high school themselves. So now more than ever are they going to need that motivation during one of the hardest and most painful times of their lives. Q2 lets you know that it's okay to be who you are and you should be proud of who you are. It teaches you not to change yourself to be what others consider normal and not give up your hopes and dreams because someone else will disagree agree with you or not even like you as a person. Q2 also cleverly uses the magic of movies to help bring its point across since that's often a way of escaping reality and teaching you good morals. That you are the star of your own movie that is your life. It's a great message to have in an RPG that's not just friendship is great, though there's still plenty of that as well, and it gives the story a bit more gravitas than simply, hey, let's trap the Persona 3 and 4 cast together and have them team up to escape and not go any deeper than that until near the end. Q2 does more with its themes to make the overall experience feel more impactful. For the first few dungeons. Okay, I know I gave that whole big speech just now saying how good this message was, but Atlas also seemed to know how good it was and made sure to remind you consistently throughout the game, to the point of hammering that message into the ground. It's all fine during Kamashita Man, Junesic Land, and AI Gus since they show you different forms of expressing individuality. By the fourth dungeon, however, the message was already made clear quite a few times and now it somewhat feels like pandering, as you're looking back through Hikari's memories and everybody simply can't believe what they're seeing. It's like, didn't we just go through all of this? Why are you guys still shocked at this point? Hikari herself is meant to represent a typical outcast that wants to make friends but can't bring herself to do so. For about two-thirds of the game, though, she can't seem to understand why the three teams stick their necks out for each other, and I think that's going a bit overboard for that type of character. Outcasts aren't stupid. Most of them know the basic concepts of friendship and teamwork. They just rarely bring themselves to join in the conversation. Hikari's supposed to be a film buff for crying out loud. Sure, 
surely she's seen at least one movie where they cover all of that stuff. She does finally figure everything out during the last couple of dungeons and becomes a decent character overall as she grows, but that's a lot of the same repeated dialogue you have to go through before you get there. Without giving it away, the twist before the final labyrinth is also nowhere near as good as it was in the first game. The dungeon itself is visually interesting and the villain's plan is actually pretty diabolical, but it still kind of goes through the motions from here onwards if you've played other Persona games. It's not a bad climax as a whole, just a little predictable. As I'm sure many of you are aware as well, Persona Q2 doesn't have any English dubbing whatsoever. The text has been localized, but the voices are all strictly Japanese, which doesn't make much sense if you ask me. I get it, it's a 2019 3DS game, the handheld's practically dead, and the Switch is the new hot thing right now, so it wouldn't have been entirely worth the effort. Counterpoint though, if you knew the 3DS was an outdated console, why did you put Q2 on the 3DS to begin with? And secondly, if you're already going through the trouble of localizing the game, then go all the way with it. Don't half-ass it because you made the weird decision to put it on an inferior console. Considering how Atlas loves to drastically update their games, I don't get why they suddenly decided not to give Persona Q2 a proper treatment in regards to the voice work. I don't have a problem with the Japanese voices and doing some reading, but I'm so used to the English voices by now that I would have at least liked to have the option, even if it was DLC. Though admittedly hearing Japanese on and the female protagonist say, let's go, is pretty cute. Let's go! Right, all of that aside, the gameplay isn't greatly different from its predecessor. You're still exploring maze-like dungeons in a first-person perspective, collecting materials from shadows and power spots, the latter of which is way quicker now by choosing to be safe or risky to obtain rarer stuff. And you still need to draw out your own map to easily find the stairs to go to the next floor of the dungeon. Battles are almost about the same too. Sub-personas for each character is one of the keys to victory. Support skills are always available in exchange for affinity points. Now with Futaba joining the fray, and hitting enemies' weaknesses earns you a boost to reduce the cost of skills to nothing. This time, however, the fighting mechanics are more like a traditional Persona game, as well as nuclear, psychokinesis, bless and curse skills returning from Persona 5, and the physical attacks being simplified again to one category. Knocking down foes and initiating all-out attacks now work just like they do in the main Persona titles, except for one more. You abuse the enemy's weakness to make them fall to the floor, and when all enemies are toppled over, bam, the all-out attack is available. Much better. Joker doesn't have to be a permanent leader either. If you want you or Minato to take charge instead, then you can. Your choice. Maps also have new icons drawn by Yusuke to signify the new traps for each dungeon. And there's a little shortcut menu you can use to save you having to scroll through icons you add to the map all the time. Does anyone else feel like you have to press slightly harder to actually draw the map though? I got used to it eventually, but it's quite an odd shift after going through the first game. Oh well. At the very least, healing and restoring SP is no longer done by paying Elizabeth as soon as you head back to the theater. Simply stepping back is all you need to do. Sweet, heavenly relief. One tiny feature I also like is that creating special personas is made more efficient by paying for the required personas all at once, rather than clearing space and buying them separately. I greatly appreciated that. Sacrificing personas is still possible as well to level up other personas since there's no social link system again, although this time it's only free to do so once for every sacrifice persona. Not a huge problem at all though, and I only used it when I desperately needed it. I'm also happy to say that the dungeons themselves are nowhere near as much of a pain in the ass as they were last time. On the extremely rare occasion, I might find myself trapped in a corner by the new FOEs with no way out other than using a go-home, but the obstacles were much easier to avoid as well as most of the FOEs, and the dungeons also don't last an eternity like the later labyrinths in Q1 did. Since I'm also a pretty big film buff, I generally find the idea of traveling in movies to be very endearing. There's a wide variety of genres to pick from and a lot you can do with. Side quests from Elizabeth return once more as well, now called special screenings, offering plenty of rewards to help you in battle. However, this time you can actually head straight to where the special screening takes place by choosing it in the theater, and the game will seclude you to a specific area to save you traveling too far. I really like this change. It keeps things moving, it's perfectly suitable for handheld gameplay, and a portion of the special screenings also create bonds between a few of the characters. It doesn't always work, like how Ryuji and Kanji fight shadows together one time and 
suddenly they're good pals, but for the most part, they do click with each other. One of my favorites of these interactions is where Junpei, Yosuke, and Ryuji all talk about how much they respect and look up to their leaders, despite the three of them not having as many qualities as Minato, Yu, and Joker. The groups then overhear this as each leader gives compliments to their best friends. It's a very nice moment and made me appreciate these guys even more, regardless of not being my personal favorites in their games. If that wasn't enough, completing these kinds of side quests will grant you access to the new Unison skills. These were awesome. They act the same way as follow-up attacks in that it comes by chance after earning a boost without knocking an enemy, either because they're already toppled over or it's a boss. It was so cool seeing the three teams kick some serious ass in a flashy way, while keeping true to their characters, and being incredibly helpful by doing a ton of damage. They're very similar to the Showtime attacks in Persona 5 Royal. I really wish these appeared more often, I never get tired of watching them. Stuff like that and even the presentation in Q2 I think is a lot better this time. Not that the first game looked terrible by any means, far from it. And while I'm not too big a fan of how the character models and animations have been reused from the original, with only the Phantom Thieves getting new ones, when comparing something as simple as menus between the two games, it's night and day. Sadly, this game isn't all perfect by any means. If I had to choose my least favorite dungeon in the game, it'd definitely be the musical Labyrinth. Not because of its cutesy aesthetics or that I hate musicals, but it brings back that gimmick from the later Q1 dungeons where you have to switch back and forth between floors, and it just becomes a nuisance after a while. The gnome FOEs were quite annoying to deal with too. If you're anywhere near their line of sight, they'll stop you dead in your tracks and charge at you. Is there any way to tell whether they're going to trigger a battle with you as well? I swear it only happens whenever it feels like it sometimes. While I'm ranting for a bit, I think they went a bit too far with the gold enemies in all of the dungeons. The trick is to find their only weakness to knock them over and instantly kill them with an all-out attack, but they heavily resist anything that isn't their weakness to like one hit points worth of damage. That and they can really wreck your progress in no time flat by using hard hitting blows that also put several types of binds on your party's front row. I hated this, there was no point in doing so other than irritating me by restricting my attacks. But at least they give you more XP, money, and rare materials to sell to Theo. Not the best way to ease the pain, I know, but better than nothing. For some twisted reason though, backup party members once again don't level up along with your main party. Why is that still a thing? I could kind of excuse it in the first game since Atlas hadn't incorporated that into other Persona titles yet, but this came out two years after Persona 5 where the uninvolved Phantom Thieves still leveled up. There's like 28 characters to pick from in Q2, surely they could have kept everybody at roughly the same level. You can use the new growth incense to catch one character up to the current highest level, which to be fair does encourage experimentation better than Q1, but there's only a handful of these spread throughout the game. And okay, as much as I like this game, the parts I never look forward to are the boss battles. I didn't really go into great detail with Q1's bosses, and that's because they were just alright. Nothing fantastic, but nothing awful either. These ones, on the other hand, are an entirely different ball game. Wow, did these fights suck. The difficulty spike was atrocious, they hit way too freaking hard, even after grinding and equipping the best available gear, and they love to throw as many cheap curveballs as they can, while also having the battles last for like 30 to 40 minutes. These were undoubtedly the low point of the game for me, and they really brought the whole experience down. They're unfair, they go on for far too long, grinding beforehand takes forever since you don't earn nearly as much XP as you level up, and they're just not fun to do. The only one that didn't give me any trouble was the final boss, but that was just a bit dull. It's a generic JRPG final boss that doesn't hit very hard but still has a ton of health. Not the most exciting way to close the game. Like with Q1 though, the optional Velvet Room boss battles are more interesting and exciting now with the inclusion of Caroline and Justine to spice it up a bit. You can't access these battles without doing the side quests that test each of the leaders, but they individually give their own special rewards, like having boosts carry over to the next battle or gaining more experience by ending the battle after an all-out attack. By winning all of the Velvet Room fights, you'll acquire everybody's ultimate personas to make things a bit easier. Very useful for the endgame stuff, especially the extra boss fight after finishing all the special screenings where you have to fight every Velvet Room attendant consecutively and in a single run, good lord. Going back to the difficulty spike, however, Q2's not quite as beginner-friendly as the original game. Story-wise, there's no relevance to each other, and there are plenty of tutorials to explain how things work, but Q2 also starts off a bit harder than its predecessor, gradually getting easier with more powerful skills and abilities. It may not give the best first impressions to newcomers. With that in mind, yeah, that is kind of a big problem. If the first or maybe even the second dungeons don't satisfy you, then it may be hard-pressed to convince you to keep going. But if you can persevere, 
then let me assure you that it does get better. Just stick with it. And that's exactly what I did. It was tough at first, but I'm glad I didn't give up because I otherwise wouldn't have experienced the greater parts of the game that would have gone overlooked. Persona Q2 improves a number of things from the original that to me makes it one of the best handheld personas to play. Fundamentally, it is the same as the first game and it's still a bit too lengthy. I have no idea how my first playthrough lasted 71 hours, but my runtime for this review was 53 hours. I did all the side quests in both of them, so not sure what happened. Despite this being a long game though, it didn't feel as long to me as the original Persona Q. The combat is more satisfying, the interactions between the three teams for the most part is one Wonderful. Whether they're goofing around or having a heart-to-heart -heart moment, and yeah, it all results in a memory wipe at the end again, which has been done to death already, but this time the journey getting there was more than enough to please me. Thanks to the bonds that everybody formed through the side quests, the departure felt even more sad than the first game, and it got me close to shedding a tear. I'm sure this will all be counteracted again if Persona Q3 is ever made, but for now it's a bittersweet ending, and as I'm watching the three teams hang out together one last time before they leave for good while that beautiful credit song plays, it really brought a smile to my face. This is a very good game. Like I said earlier though, the only major problems I have is the steep difficulty curve and specifically the boss fights. They're too frustrating to be fulfilling and could potentially alienate some Persona fans and newbies. But yeah, similar to the first game, you're only going to get the most out of Persona Q2 anyway if you play Persona 3, 4, and 5. That's now three extremely lengthy RPGs you'll have needed to play before heading into Q2. It's fan service, but it's enjoyable fan service. Just be ready for the challenge at the start. And that concludes the Persona spin-off marathon until whenever Persona 5 Scramble comes out. I hope you guys have really enjoyed these videos. It was very interesting and somewhat bizarre to see what we could do with Seize, the investigation team, and the Phantom Thieves either during or after their initial stories. We may be done with the spin-offs for now anyway, but I have a little bonus video for you all next time. I'll see you then. And that's exactly what I did. It was tough at first, but I'm gra- I'm grad? Persona Q2 New Cinema Labyrinth is v is the- v With that in mind, is it not only a solid sub- <laughs>